Beloved in the Lord, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. The little boy came into the kitchen as he had so many times before and plopped down and said, Mom, can I ask you a question? Sure, his mother said. What if there wasn't any gravity? Ah, the joy of a young mind. The mother started to talk about all the things that would not happen if there weren't any gravity. Well, you you couldn't sit here on this chair if we didn't have gravity, the mother said. That's what holds you down, puts you in place. She went to the refrigerator, took out the the milk and, and, and got a glass and began to pour him a glass of milk. And she said, I couldn't do this without gravity. The milk would just float around everywhere. And she took out a cookie and put it down and put it on a plate and and set it before him and said, your cookie and your plate wouldn't stay on the table without gravity. Oh, the boy said, okay. Mother smiled and walked out of the kitchen and started going to the next room. And she rounded the corner and there in the middle of the floor was her best vase shattered into pieces, flowers dripping water splattered everywhere and she shouted well what happened to my vase gravity came the reply from the little boy in the kitchen still enjoying his cookie i tell that story because you see it's one thing to ask a question hypothetically it's quite another to ask a question that has a direct purpose behind it And I'm trying to decide in our gospel lesson today which one Peter is doing. Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Is that a hypothetical question? A for instance kind of question? Or because Peter says another member of the church, is Peter asking this question with a particular face in mind, a name, a person? It makes a difference. Because asking about forgiveness hypothetically is not the same as asking about it in specific. Hypothetically, you know, I can love everyone. I'll bet you can too. But cut me off in traffic and the specific feelings that I may have for that particular person will not be of love and affection. Hypothetically, I know what God would have me do. I can even say it out loud, let it roll off my tongue. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus taught. And in the realm of the hypothetical, applied to everyone in general, that seems right and and even possible. But press such a requirement to a specific person with whom you perhaps disagree, and, and it becomes a bit more difficult. I am to love the Lord my God with all my heart. Well, that means letting nothing else be so dear to me than God. That means choosing the will of God over my own inclinations, my own desires, and, well, what I might sometimes call as my own better judgment. That gets hard. Sure, I'm to love God, but but God really wouldn't want me to, you can fill in the blank here for yourself, put whatever you'd like in there. But yes, that's exactly what God would require you to set aside if it stood in the way of God's will and God's desire and God himself. I'm to love the Lord with God with all my soul. That means caring for nothing, no one as much as I do for God. That's something that seems nearly impossible because I love God, yes, but I also love my wife and I love my kids and I love my family and surely God would never ask me to put God above the needs of their happiness. 
I'm to love the Lord my God with all my strength. That means using every resource at my disposal to do the work of God. There is nothing that I should call my own, no gift, no talent, no part of my purse or piece of my life that I should not be willing to give up if God so demanded it of me. How hard that is. And I'm to love my neighbor with the same fervor that I love myself. And that means that particular person over there who has a face and a name and who has perhaps done something in particular that upsets me. That person I am to give the same energy for doing things for him or for her as I would do for myself, as I would do for God. You see what I'm saying here? Hypothetically, it's easy to give lip service to this matter of following and forgiving, but when you you get down to the particulars, it's not so easy. Which is why Jesus tells this parable to drive home the particulars. 10,000 talents, that's what's owed. It is an impossible sum. A talent was roughly 15 years worth of wages. So, So to pay back what is owed, this servant would only need to give up everything he would make for the next 667 years. The point of this parable is that there's no hope for repayment here. The slave's begging and pleading is a ridiculous gesture. His fate is already sealed. The great surprise in the parable is how much mercy the master has. The unforgivable is forgiven. The slave has a new lease on life. And now what will he do with that gift? And what does the slave do with it? Well, he fails to recognize the gift that's been given to him, which seems an awful lot like what we would do with it as well. When he meets a fellow slave who owes him a mere 100 denarii, he shows no such mercy. A denarii is a day's worth of wages. So a hundred days worth of pay, this would be a manageable sum. This could be repaid in less than a year if the slave would but give his fellow slave a chance. Or better yet, if he were to extend to this slave who owes him a hundred denarii the same gracious gift that has been received by him, the relationship between the two slaves would be restored, a clean slate, debt-free, a fresh start for everyone. But that he's not willing to do. The parable ends badly for the first slave, not because the master is not merciful, but because rather the master's mercy has been tossed aside, not appreciated, not understood. 667 years of torture and work now await because this slave could not confer to the other the very gift that he had been so freely given already. Now back up to Peter's question. Is this hypothetical? Or does Peter have someone in mind when he asks Jesus? You you see what Jesus does here? Jesus changes the question. It's not a question of how often one needs to forgive or, or figuring out how much is owed, but rather just how much scorekeeping do you really want done? And do you really want it done with you? It's Peter asking Jesus a question about forgiveness. How many times? That's that's a question that invites a sense of scorekeeping, doesn't it? It implies that there's a set number of times, a limit that can be reached, a maximum point at which you can write off that other person. How many times do I have to suffer the indignity of his cheating or her lying or their deceptive behavior? How many times? We tend to ask scorekeeping questions hypothetically because truth is... We're never quite sure what that breaking point will be for us, right? We get caught up in cycles of repetition, and each time we tell ourselves, you know, this is going to be the last time that I let them off the hook, or, or, or that'll be the last time that I fall for that line, or, or this will be the last time I'll let them get by with doing that. Scorekeeping. But scorekeeping is not a very satisfying way to live, and 
And we know that. We know that from our own experience of having to offer forgiveness because most of the time when we ask forgiveness questions like this, we're asking them from the point of view of really, really caring about that other person. Ask a father, how many times are you willing to take back your wayward child? And they won't give you a number. Ask a mother how many times she's going to keep dipping into her purse to pay off the, the bills for the struggling child who just can't get ahead. And they won't give you a number. They may ask themselves how many times, but the truth of the matter is because love and relationship are involved here, there is no finite number available, nor should there be. You do it as much as you need to because there is no way to assign a value to it. Not if relationship and restoring relationship are your goals. And that's what Jesus' goals seem to be. What God's goals are. So Jesus moves the question from hypothetical to a matter of the heart. And he doubles down on the seriousness of it. When this question rises in your heart and in your head, how many times... Remember that in the end, there is no such thing as a hypothetical question on the matter of forgiveness. God in Christ Jesus always makes it about the specific. That one for whom you are raising the question. And God in Christ Jesus always ultimately makes it about you. How often do you want God to forgive you? How often do you want forgiveness extended to you? Seven times? Seventy times seven? How can you not pass along to others the one thing that God so freely gives to you? That's what the question, what the gospel wants us to ask today. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.